Okay, good afternoon. Firstly, I want to uh, thank you to Horticulture Innovation Australia for their investment in the cherry industry uh, through their support of my research topic. Uh, my name's Tom Eastlake. My wife Janelle and I are first generation cherry farmers from the southwest slopes of New South Wales. We farm approximately 50 hectares of cherries in Young, the cherry capital of Australia, as well as running our own packing and export operation. Janelle and I are blessed to be joined in Young by our daughter Chloe and our son TJ. So the, Australia cherry, the Australian cherry industry is one that, like many around the world, have realised that the uh, quality of fruit is the principal driver of an acceptable return for the Australian producer. Large, hard, sweet, dark colour, dark flesh, smooth skin, long shelf life and a green stem is what the consumer in Australia and indeed around the world demands. Now, while production in Australia does continue to advance, much of the research and development undertaken here is focused pre-harvest. Nutrition, varietal selection, pruning, um, pruning method rather, uh, rootstock, disease mitigation are all ongoing focuses of the Australian cherry producer. Uh, however, post-harvest management of fruit has not had the same focus. So journeying to the US, Canada, Italy, Germany, Belgium, Thailand, Vietnam, the Philippines, China, Singapore and Malaysia. What are the key opportunities learnt from these uh, markets uh, for the uh, industry to uh, undertake in post-harvest management of fruit, not just in managing cold chain, but also in fruit handling and packaging materials? So the importance of maintaining cold chain is uh, well acknowledged around the world. Visiting Lin Long at Oregon State University, he has indicated that in his cherry research uh, that for every hour outside of cold chain post-harvest, a week of shelf life is lost. So statistics like that reverberate around the industry and indeed around the world. However, the degree of focus in advancing cold chain management does vary significantly. So in Germany and Belgium, much of their R&D is, is absolutely first class in the world, with research into new varieties being released onto the market, undergoing some of the most rigorous testing of any varietal trials anywhere in the world. Similarly, their work in assessing pruning techniques, fertiliser application and rain covers is very thoroughly undertaken. So it is surprising, therefore, to see packing of fruit still done in field and delivered to aggregators and markets without being hydrocooled and with no cold, in, cold chain introduced until receival at a central delivery point. In scenes reminiscent of uh, Young in the early 1980s, where much of the fruit produced, fruit produced was delivered to market in, a, in small individual consignments, uh, the same can be seen in these markets. Cooperatives in Germany still operate where fruit can be received from anywhere but from a number of crates or boxes in the back of a hatchback to full pallets of commercial uh, shipments inbound on trucks but still unrefrigerated. While larger consignments from larger producers have indeed seen hydrocooling and packhouse grading uh, by mechanical or optical cherry graders, other smaller consignments may have been picked, graded and packed in field and taken directly to the cooperative with no cold chain management or refrigeration being evident. Across the border in Belgium, the same practice can be seen. While there are large scale pack houses in these regions that are packing fruit on mechanical or optical cherry graders, there's still a prevalence of much fruit being sorted and packed in field. It's incredible to see these orchards, which are absolutely world class in all math methods of production, but with little focus on the post harvest cold chain. The lead horticulturalist in Germany's Rheinhold Falls region, Martin Bulmer, admits that this is something that requires much greater focus. However, things in Belgium are looking somewhat improved with new labelling requirements requiring that fruit being labelled if they have been hydrocooled with an H designation prior to fruit size and agents there advising that the standard is being followed and the market has responded by paying a premium for fruit that has been hydrocooled. Now, hydrocooling notwithstanding, however, after delivery to transit hubs, uh, the cold chain management is very well maintained. With refrigerated trucks used and excellent cold storage facilities, maintaining fruit remains at a constant temperature. Now, in contrast to the presence of limited hydrocooling in some of these European markets, in the US and Canada, large-scale growers maintain their cold chain extremely well. Visiting the Matheson's family at Stamilt in Washington State, large mobile hydrocoolers are used in field to decrease the amount of time it takes for fruit to get down below three degrees and into refrigeration. Now, mobile hydrocoolers are a very expensive uh, investment. 
However, their investment is translating directly to much improved fruit, and it can be seen across the fruit that they're producing that their quality is extremely good. Cold chain management is maintained through delivery to pack house where fruit is held in cold storage prior to packing. And if money was no object, this is absolutely where you would want to be. And the sheer size of these growers in the US facilitates this sort of investment and allows growers to see a return on investments such as refrigerated trucks and mobile hydrocoolers. And while mobile hydrocoolers are not unknown in Australia, uh, and many industries do employ them to cool fresh produce, they're not significantly seen in the Australian cherry industry. Now, fruit handling post-harvest is still a key issue for many growers. Speaking to Matt Whiting of Washington State University, their research has, so, has shown that much uh, more damage can occur to previously undamaged fruit post-harvest through mishandled uh, and misplaced uh, fruit handling much more than what can be done at times pre-harvest. So Steve Cohen at US company Macroplastics describes their revision of their designs of fruit bins to accept smaller volumes to prevent impact, pitting and compaction damage, and grading manufacturers such as Unitech, Compaq and Australia's own GP graders, which now are allowing tipping of smaller fruit receptacles into graders. Now these smaller receptacles, which may be a lug or a tote, uh, can now be accommodated in such things as a tote tipper, which compares to traditional, pick traditional picking and packing methods where fruit can be tipped into different containers three times before they've even been re received at the packing shed, to these now uh, small scale tote tippers now allowing fruit to be only tipped once uh, and that is into the grater itself. Now, but for small, for small growers that's fine, but for large growers that's going to be something that they're probably not going to be able to implement because of the scale that they, get, that they have and the throughput they require. Now, advancements have still been seen here with the old wooden bins being ditched for new plastic bins and rotary bin tippers and such, and that allows for fruit to be submerged before tipping, and that's all helped and while maintaining their increased throughput requirements. Now, full graders on water, such as this at the new compact machine in Washington State at Monson Fruits, are indicative of the graders that are being used around the world now. These machines with dual rotary bin tippers and all fruit transported in water flumes rather than belts and elevators have all been specifically designed to decrease impact on fruit. This is even extended to some pack houses in Washington who maintain separate packing lines for the delicate rainier cherries, a cherry that requires extreme levels of care, um, to ensure the fruit doesn't get marked. Now, while running two separate lines is fairly common and has been done in this market for some time, Chris Monson's machine also includes a partially dry line for packing Skeena cherries, which have a tendency to crack after submerging in water. So Chris's grader can pack three separate ways, low impact for rainier cherries, low water exposure for Skeena, or full water exposure for everything else. So grading technology does continue to improve with much of the developments made in recent years being driven as much by the producer as the manufacturers themselves. These improvements could be monumental leaps forward like optical and digital cherry graders or far more subtle improvements as we are seeing now. Visiting Benedetta Lamino at uh, Italian manufacturer Unitech, she recommends now graders all be one single long line after testing that they've done showing that any bending grader is, pr is pr uh, giving fruit additional points to be damaged during the grading process. Similarly, Benedetta's team have pursued the development of a new cluster cutter saw, which is a departure from the long held industry standard, to prevent removal of stems and a revision of all drop points across their gr graders to prevent fruit damage. Now, while these developments are small and they're incremental steps for improvement, they have served to see continual improvement in two areas that growers are constantly battling with. Now, while talking fruit handling, most growers will seek to do the best they can, whether it be pre-harvest or post-harvest. However, any producer that believes that their responsibility ends after shipment is going to have a distinct change of mindset to face. Research done by the Australian cherry industry has shown that cherries remain principally an impulse buy by the Australian consumer. In fact, the largest by distinct margin demographic that, produces cherries in, that purchases cherries in Australia, says they purchase them only after seeing them in store. Less than 5% of consumers actually going to the supermarket planning on purchasing cherries in the first place. And this data is supported by data co collected in other countries around the world, including consumer research done by the Washington cherry industry in the US and work done by private businesses in Southeast Asia. In fact, some of these businesses in Southeast Asia, such as the top supermarket chain in Thailand, base their whole retail strategy around consumers' desire to purchase fruit on impulse. 
So the proliferation of, of cherries in a top supermarket during the US cherry industry is nothing short of amazing. With fruit present at every single checkout in all sections of the store and not just in fresh produce, and fruit being packed into punnets and bags in front of the consumer to display how fresh the product is. And while cherries are indeed a prize purchase in Thailand, this strategy has worked with sales of cherries increasing significantly since their change of marketing approach. However, the challenge to growers is this duty of care that they have to their fruit after it leaves the packhouse, and research done by the Australian cherry industry in 2011 indicates that based on consumer feedback and review of their buying habits, every, every one single box of cherries that is sold that provides a negative experience, this leads to a further four boxes of cherries remaining unsold. So this remains an ongoing challenge for the Australian producer, both domestically and internationally, as the prevalence of poor quality fruit on market shelves is something that's seen annually across Australia. So packaging for retail air, air for the retail sale has been an area of increased focus in recent times in Australia due to high levels of shrinkage experienced in the retail environment due to customers' desire to handle fruit, sift through it before they purchase. And this level of waste has at times caused retailers to completely cease trading cherries due to the challenges that they pay, place in the retail environment. So a move to pre-packaged product has been embraced more and more. However, we still see commonly loose cherries for sale at harvest time. So punnets were the first pre-packs that were seen in the mainstream domestically and they're still used internationally and here, um, although there is a much more increasing prevalence of either random weight or fixed weight bags. So fixed weight bags are much more expensive to pack, but with e electronic grading systems they are now being facilitated to be packed at a much lower rate. Regardless, bags are still seeing little limited use in Australia more but with significant success where they are being introduced. Speaking to, to large-scale growers domestically, they voiced their frustration after years of getting two of Australia's supermarkets to adopt bags after the US cherry industry were able to see increases of consumption by 30% in a single year in a shift that has been largely attributed to the introduction of random weight bags. Speaking to Chris Monson and Wes Matheson, they do lament the initial difficulty of migrating to the technology to fill random weight bags and fixed weight bags, but the growth of the domestic market since their introduction has made this transition worthwhile. But the Australian cherry industry's principal market is not actually domestic, while this is important. The focus is still on export markets. And in Southeast Asian countries such as Thailand, Singapore, Taiwan and of course China, it is worth noting the prevalence of pre-packs in these markets. So this could be larger kilogram or two kilogram gift boxes of ultra premium cherries in China, or it could be smaller punnets or bags in China or other markets. As previously noted, the prevalence of, of pre-packed cherries in Thailand is quite well exhibited, but this can also be seen in markets such as Singapore and Malaysia. Now, while some importers in these countries are seeing imports direct of pre-packaged product, due to the lower volumes that can be shipped with pre-packs uh, due to a lower per cubic metre of freight space, importers in these markets are recommending that anybody shipping to these markets should pre-partner should partner with a pre-packer in these markets prior to shipping. This provides much more flexibility in packaging and uh, access to much cheaper labour on that end. So cold chain management in Australia is quite good compared to the rest of the, part, the, rest of the world. However, it still does lag the world's best. Implementing automated packing lines in Australia as seen in North America will come in time, no doubt, but industry packhouse size currently will limit adoption in some operations for now. Packaging has improved significantly, but it's still unfortunate to see this continuing to lag the world's best operators. The facts speak for themselves. Better packaging leads to a higher consumption and a better consumer experience. So much needs to be done at the shop front to give the consumer the best possible product, and this is likely to drive growth of, con of con consumption domestically and internationally more than any other factor. And growers will need to partner with distribution that see their fruit handled with the respect and care that it requires. So none of this would have happened without the support of my family, so I'd like to acknowledge uh, my family, Janelle, Chloe and TJ, whose understanding, patience and their love allowed me to undertake the project in the first place. They are the reason that I farm in the first place and I do thank them very much for their support. I also thank my investment partner, Horticulture Innovation Australia, who saw the value in this research project being undertaken, and thank you to Nuffield Australia for providing the platform that has facilitated this undertaking and for the introduction of new friends and mentors.
And finally, I would like to acknowledge our 2015 Nuffield Scholars who aren't able to join with us here today, but who we look forward to hearing the conclusion of their own research at a later date. So our support, love and best wishes go to Rob Webb, Richard Appleton, Stacey Loftus and their families, and especially to my GFP mate Andy Clark and his family. Andy really did support me on the GFP as much as anybody else, and I know the, the time he's going through at the moment with his family, and the love of, my, of me and my family go to Andy and his family at this time, and I wish them all the best. Thank you very much.